So, as an investor, and you worked for some time as a consultant as well, so consultants have, they think about businesses um, entirely different from a founder. Um, they are probably going to be more logical, whereas a founder could be like, I must do this, I must do this. And so, now you're an investor, what are some mental frameworks that you use when you, you have a deck in front of you? What mental frameworks do you like go through to decide whether you want to have a call with this founder or even whether you want to invest with them? I think one is just understanding the market opportunity. And so whether that is a company that's a fintech or it's a company that's an agribusiness, you need to understand in the specific area that they're playing, what's the actual market size? Who are the target customers? Do you have a belief that they're going to be able to target those customers with the product that they're offering or service that they're offering? Um, and then we also like to understand the competitive environment. So usually before I'll have looked at a deck, we have some amount of past research that we've done. So in different sectors, whether that's in fintech or trade enablement, I'm calling it these days logistics or um, in agri, we've done landscapings where we have identified different founders operating across the different segment areas. And so we start to get a sense for where we would be excited about investing. And if that opportunity fits within where we're excited about it, you can almost immediately see from the team like, oh, this is an area we should look into further. And then you, of course, do further diligence to get to know the market opportunity and the founder and the team and all of that. Okay, so I'm still interested in markets because uh, everybody's market size is 200 million. And um, I saw one tweet recently and <laughs> um, the person said, probably the numbers that we saw from Funka Kindele's movies where, I can't remember the exact numbers now, um, but that's probably more indicative of our market size, and it's way less than 100, um, 100 million, which, I mean, people are always put in 200 million. So how do you think about market size, especially in Nigeria now, how do you think about market size? And when you see what startups present, how do you think about market size? A lot of it depends on who you're targeting from a consumer perspective. So if you're targeting... Um, what we might call a mass market consumer, then you probably are actually targeting a very large percent of the population. Let's call it 60 to 70 percent of the population. But if you're only targeting like the highest income consumer, then you're only really targeting the top, let's call it one to five percent consumer. I'm much less interested from an investing perspective in targeting the top one to five percent consumer, which is generally overserved in terms of products and services and actually has a relatively small market size compared to the mass market. And so I think part of it is really understanding who is your target customer and is the scale of that target segment venture scalable? And by that, we usually are saying, okay, can you grow by 10x? Can you grow to 100 million revenue? Can you grow to 200 million revenue? Like what's the potential spending power of that uh, market segment that you're targeting? And then if you're targeting maybe the upper mass market, we'll call it emerging middle class consumer. In Nigeria, the numbers suggest about 50, 53 million consumer class. And this is people who are spending $12 a day or more. And so that's still a pretty significant segment to, to target. Um, but I think it's still overlooked because people are going for the, I don't know, the highest end consumers oftentimes, not always, but we, we definitely look at that in our analysis. Um, and it's challenging to serve an entire country. And so you have to also focus and start somewhere. So maybe your market size now is actually very different than what it will be 10 years from now. Okay. Uh, so let's get back to you. Um, as a founder, what are some mistakes you've seen other founders make when they are trying to either decide on an idea or come up with ideas? I think, um, hmm, well, <laughs> I, think, I, I think that sometimes you are maybe more interested in, or when you're too much in love with the idea, right, um, such that you start to even ignore what the market is telling you. Um, it's a mistake I've made, it's a mistake I've seen people make. Um, you have a concept, maybe you believe um, that this would solve 
solve the problem, right? And somebody will pay for it. But you've, you've gone to test it. You've put it in the market. You've done an ad. Nobody's clicking. Nobody's paying for it. Obviously, um, your mother loves you. She'll buy it. Um, if you have a spouse, they'll buy it. And your brother and your sister. So you have sales for five people. Um, and after that, nobody else is buying. Um, but you, you stubbornly insist. Um, now, maybe, maybe stubborn is not the right word because some people have been able to maybe take feedback from the market and improve the product, right? Uh, but if you're not taking feedback, you're not, you know, iterating and you're just, um, you're just stubbornly insisting on that initial idea or, or the solution, as, as the case may be, which maybe is another angle I'll talk about now, then that might be a problem, right? And, and the second one, I already alluded to it, which is you are focused on a particular solution. Um, you think this is the solution to this problem, and then you're focused on it. Meanwhile, this person has a problem. This person has a pain point, um, but you, you are just so caught up in how fancy and how brilliant um, your solution um, idea is that you don't want to move from it. So I think not focusing on the problem and dwelling too much on the initial um, form of the idea as opposed to, you know, iterating as um, time goes by. Okay. Um, I think blockchain and AI guys, they, they have a lot of experience with this. So, um, everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face, right? Um, startups often have to pivot because either the idea you have was too early for the, for the market or the market really doesn't need a, the, the solution you, you have. Um, what, what are some challenges to pivot in? Because sometimes from the outside looking in, right, you see a startup that is clearly not exactly doing well, and the sensible thing is, okay, if you really want to stay alive, go do something else, but often founders are very reluctant to do that. What are some challenges you've seen founders struggle with around pivoting? Yeah, I think very interesting question, and we were just discussing this um, earlier before we started the panel. Um, struggles with pivoting, it's, it, it depends on the situation, right? Um, there could be, the most common one people will say is capital. Um, somebody will say, that's, that's always the easiest guy to blame. <laughs> oh, I don't have money. Uh, they say, oh, we're supposed to do this new product, I don't have money. Um, yeah, there's, there's that. But I find that a lot of time, at the root of it is, is really... I think sometimes maybe, I'm not sure if it's inability or unwillingness to learn and unlearn what you know. Because if, if truly capital is even the problem, um, when we say innovation, innovation is not just about the product you're building. You can be innovative in operations, in hiring, in how you even finance the business, right? Um, that is like 360 degree innovation. The innovation is not just in the product as a lot of people would think. Um, so if if you're willing to sort of unlearn um, or maybe have the humility to um, listen to people that might know better or differently, um, it, it would, um, it, it, I think it makes a lot of difference because that, that's what will allow you to drop what you thought was the killer idea to then go to the markets or talk to other people that might um, know, know better. And I, I think a lot of times, and I was reading an article recently, I mean, can't call the name of startups, uh, but if you look at um, what's happening in the startup space, a lot of people are technically brilliant um, and um, they struggle commercially um, with finance, with sales, with compliance, with the other business stuff. I think what the article said is the things are not cool. You know, we like the branded Sycamore t-shirt, picture on tech point, you know, and all of that stuff, um, fancy products, fancy branding, but the other things that are not very fancy um, that people um, sort of have to learn. And a, a lot of times, you need to pivot because you have a cash issue, right? Um, that's what really would pivot, whether you can't raise or you can't sell enough. Um, so I would say um, a lot of us also need to be more, um, to be more flexible commercially in terms of learning how to even innovate around the commercial aspects of the business. Okay. Yeah, just a reflection there. I think there is a piece around the financials that you were mentioning. So keeping an eye on where you are in terms of the run rate and even what room do you have to make this pivot happen is really important. Um, and then the storytelling around it. 
because especially where you're a venture-backed company and you need to raise additional capital in order to fund the pivot, you oftentimes actually have to bring people along with you on that journey. So where are you, how's the performance, and why are we now excited about this idea versus maybe the idea that you had when we invested one, two, three, four, five years ago. So I think part of it is that storytelling piece. Um, and then maybe that continual innovation process, which you referenced, because even if you get the company to a certain stage, that might not be the thing that's gonna be the type of high growth and sort of scale or answering the right problem uh, from your customers. And so being open to not even just pivots, but additional new business lines, new revenue lines, I think is really important part of the, of the journey. Um, and noting, obviously, at Vested World, we're investing a very small amount in seed and pre-seed, and mostly in companies that are Series A, and now some of them have you know, moved into Series B+. Plus. But even there, you're needing to think about what new products to add and where to really deploy capital to in a funding environment that's quite challenging. So keeping that innovation mindset, I think, is important for pivots or even business growth in general. All right. So like I mentioned earlier, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, please note them down and we will take them once we're done here. Okay. So two questions. Uh, one is you have this really great idea. You're going, to the, um, you're going to the market and consumers are not exactly getting it. You have to make a decision. Do I stick with this idea or, or do I go do something else? How do I balance as a founder um, the feedback I'm getting from the market with my intuition or what I think is going to be a great idea because in the words of a founder who shall not be named, um, customers don't always know what they want. So how do I balance that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, in the words of Steve Jobs. Okay. <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think that the way to balance that is, um, from my perspective, you can do it... Um, I, I like to give myself a timeline, right? Um, and say, okay, can we stop at this certain stage? And that depends on a number of factors, how much runway you have, what is the context around, how, how long you can stay alive and keep trying um, versus what is the reality. But I think sometimes, generally, we don't, um, and I say this now because I'm, I've been guilty of it in the past, um, we also have to embrace like a um, experimental mindset, right? Um, to, to be able to run mini, mini experiments. What do I mean is, okay, can we just try this for maybe two or three months and see the results? We're not saying that we are changing our minds. We're not changing the entire business model. It's more like um, sort of like an A-B testing because we're not sure, right? We're not 100% sure that this new direction will work. So let's take um, 10, 20 customers. Let's try this and see if... Um, that's how I typically convince my, some of my team guys. Um, so I have people that I work with some of them are very stubborn. People like my product manager now, for example. And he'll say, no, today's not going to work. I say, okay, please give us 20 people. Let's, let's even send them emails and see if they'll click it. That's all I want to see. And if they do, we can then start to make an informed decision. And we can start to, um, I told you so, I didn't tell you so. You know, this kind of conversation. So I think um, I, I like timelines um, and where you can really just cut your losses. And I also would um, encourage some sort of experimentation on a smaller level to even test the alternative when something doesn't seem to be working right so that you can do it with a minimal um, cost and even time. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I like that. Basically, building MVPs within your startup just to validate your thought. Um, Neka, how much of a role does the competition play when I'm thinking about my idea? Or how much of a role should they play? In a way, most companies I see and that we've invested in are not the first of the kind to do this idea. And so I think 
it's important to know there's going to be competition because even if there isn't competition, somebody's going to see that you're doing well and then they're going to go and copy you. So I think part of it is less about competition, but what is your competitive advantage, whether it's on your team, um, whether it's about your experience, whether that's in terms of technology or for the sector understanding. Um, so I think competition is important especially where there are large players that you might need to disrupt or where it's a highly political space that you need to understand how to navigate that you know, ethically and all of that. But I think it is not a deal breaker if there is competition. Um, what can be challenging though is if there's, for example, a, an incredibly well-funded <laughs> startup in the exact same space, that can be tricky because we can maybe see their history and understand what it takes to grow and scale. And so then you really have to be able to, for example, fundraise, you have to be able to execute and deliver. And so a lot of it really depends on the background of the founder and our belief in the founder to be able to, to navigate. Um, and then for the category creating type of companies, I think you just have to have a belief in the vision and again, that execution ability of the founder. So if I look at two of our companies in Nigeria, Drugstock and Shuttlers, uh, in a way they have similar origin stories, meaning that either the founders had experience, lived experience or work experience in the space and the problem that they were gonna try and solve. Um, and while maybe other people were doing it, they didn't have the long-term vision and large vision that maybe these founders have, which is in Shuttler's case to transform mass transit for Africa and in Drugstock's case to deliver healthcare for, for all at a, at a more affordable cost point. And so I think you have to look the founders in the eye a bit and know that they're going to have this long-term view. And it doesn't matter what their competitors are doing left or right, but that they're going to really focus on that long-term vision. All right. Okay, so I think we'll take, um, we'll take two questions and then we'll continue with the conversation. Okay, two hands. Uh, all right, so please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is to Nika. Please, I want to find out, when you look at a, a startup, which do you consider more important, the team or the idea? I think it's similar to founder versus idea. Um, I think the team is definitely important, and especially if the founders have built a team that balance their strengths and weaknesses. So if you're looking at, let's say, a founder, and you're like, okay, we understand the technical part, but they're not great at selling, who on the team is gonna be great at selling, and is the founder aware of that, and for example, bring them to the pitch, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, so there, part of it is not just the team, but like the relationship am, amongst the team. Um, that being said, there are going to be some great teams that don't have a good idea. And so then it comes down to this innovation sort of cycle and can they actually happen upon or land on the right idea uh, as a team, whether with my funding, hopefully with my funding, <laughs> but, or in future, future financing rounds. But. All right, so I think that was one Andy. Same question. All right, okay. No, but... how, how do you determine if you're going to form the business, especially if the data size of the market is vague? In what sense? Um, I was with the regulator like last month, and they themselves didn't have an exact idea of the market. But they are telling us that, well, with this thing you're trying to do, you could even sell data to us, but we won't start with you. You have to start first because we're looking for exclusive territorial rights, and they said they couldn't offer us that. So they asked us to go to the marketplace to compete. But you check all secondary sources of data, there's nothing, right? So because you know it's still a emerging economy, data is generally non-existent. So how do you determine you would invest? Do you just go with what the founders think? Or you have a way to get your own data? Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of data, uh, I would say. Um, some of it is going to be based on, like, work we've done historically. 
So it might be that we've looked into like agri-tech, for example, or agribusiness, and we've actually talked to a range of companies. We have a sense for the number of customers that they're working with, their number of farmers that they're working with. We have a sense for perhaps ability and willingness to pay. So you can start to back into some of the market size based on, I'd say, ability to pay in other sectors. I am have historically not been as bullish on the data piece, but if you're very sector specific and can deliver insights that are worth purchasing, I've seen companies actually be able to grow and scale. I think the companies that have been more like, we're gonna do all kinds of macroeconomic data becomes a bit more challenging versus, okay, I have a very specific sector where we know there are buyers for this data. Part of it is going to be just demonstrating that you can sell. And so once you've sold a data set, let's say, to one or two customers in a specific segment, then you can start to say, okay, other customers are going to be very interested in this data. But it's sometimes hard to do it early on. And so your numbers might be like high in the sky, 200 million. <laughs> but over time, you'll refine that market sizing based on your uptake and based on your customers. Okay, so I think I'll ask you a variation of our question, right? So we have reports everywhere about what could be the possible market size here. And I'm guessing that's part of the question he's asking. Um, founders usually use that um, whenever they're trying to back up the market size. There's no point to one working see reports on PwC report from somewhere, probably even 10 years ago. Um, how do I use, like... I call it proximate data now. Not like direct data, but data from perhaps a different industry um, to actually determine the market size. So that's a very interesting question. I think, I think you can use proxy for many things um, from different industries depending on the segment. And so I like the example you use for, you know, um, from Kaki Dele's movie about um, whether that determines the value of the market. And take that packet somewhere. So the question is, let's now look at the attributes of that particular event. Um, how much is the average movie ticket, right? Um, if you are selling something in that category, um, then maybe you can compare. So that's one dimension, the cost of it. Now, how many states have cinemas, right? That's also, location is also in an important segment because a lot of times when people try to look at market size, as well. There's a lot of geographical nuance that is not considered. If you look at a company like Dangote, like MTN, they sell, those are one trillion naira companies, but they sell all across Nigeria. A lot of startups sell in Lagos, Abuja, maybe Port Harcourt. That's for the, for the ones that even you know, go beyond Lagos, right? So the question is, and Neka put it very um, well when she said, look, a lot of people are trying to sell to the top um, class, right? So. The, the market size also um, it depends on the it depends on the um, the kind of um, product or service that you're offering. It depends on the geographical reach of it. If you are doing a business for you want to do a software now for banks, obviously you'll be concentrated in Lagos and you have a limited uh, market size. I was with um, one executive in USC um, recently, and he was telling me that look, they sell. Nobody's going to believe the amount of gala that they sell in Lagos every day. They sell maybe 400,000 pieces, something ridiculous like that, right? So this is gala, right? It's, um, commodity is cheap. The number is much higher than, a, you know, Funke Akidele's movie. So I would say that um, I like to use other industries to compare um, and just take a, a, very high level, um, a very high level view of what is possible. So if I say, oh, I'm going to target people in Lagos, I can look at the population for Lagos, but I can look at how many tickets um, um, Funke and Kudele sold. If I want to exempt Lagos, I'll look at how many lines. I'll say, okay, maybe the average person um, is using maybe two sims or something because maybe we don't have over 100 million, whatever. But these are all assumptions that you can sense check from other industries. Um, but I like to use um, like big consumer markets like MTN, Dangote, to just... Listen, because you can sell 100 Naira airtime, because they sell it everywhere. Um, so if I take that market, I then begin to dissect it with 
um, other things from other industries, and then you have two extremes, and then you can start to look in the middle. Look, at the end of the day, as an educated guess, nobody's going to tell you spot on that they are, you're going to be able to sell 10 T-shirts in Lagos if you come today, right? You're going to look at the data you have um, from other industries, look at the price point, look at the location, and then make an educated, informed you know, analysis. All right. Um, so, Neka, how much of a role does time in play in what makes a winning startup idea? Uh, <laughs> it, it might be one of the most important factors, actually. Um, so, growing up, um, my father had a bookstore in the U.S., and um, it was... It grew relatively large, I'll say. At some point, I think he had maybe seven or eight branches across two cities, and... Um, and yet, <laughs> the timing was really important. So it was essentially at around the time that Amazon was launching. And of course, <laughs> at the time, it was actually not good for black, for any bookstores, independent bookstores in general. There was a period of time where Amazon was just killing them. But now, <clears throat> I don't know if it's the generational thing. People are going somehow back to books and especially to independent bookstores. And I think maybe part of it is because of technology. People want to have community and connection points in person rather than only online. And so all of a sudden, there's this almost like renaissance of independent bookstores in the US and especially black bookstores. And it's a bit sad. I'm like, oh man, if only we could have like kept the business open <laughs> through that <laughs> more challenging period. And now is the time, really. And so I, I think it is really important. Um, but you're almost not going to know until you're looking in hindsight, like, was it the right opportunity at the right time with the right team to make this happen? So it's important, but if you don't start, you're not going to know. Okay, so I think my last question, because, yeah, last question would be, so I've tried this thing out, um, done it for a few months, I'm not seeing much traction, or I'm seeing traction, but it's not financial traction. Um, how do I cut my losses? How do I let go of a startup? In an honorable way as well. That's tough. Um, that's very tough. Again, um, Nick has already given me a lot of wisdom that I would also share. If the if you were if you are very loud already, when I say loud, like you're appearing on tech points, speaking at all events, yeah, you have fancy marketing, you're on Twitter fighting people. <laughs> Please still sponsor our events the next we'll sponsor, time. No, no, no. We are, sponsor. We'll sponsor people now. Don't worry. We'll keep sponsoring your events. Um, it, it's going to be very difficult to. I think it's going to be very difficult to go quietly. Very, very difficult. Even if you try to keep it quiet, somebody will pick it up from somewhere. Um, in fact, there was a startup recently. Somebody saw the information last year and they brought it back and said, ah, the startup has crashed. Meanwhile, the startup has crashed like last year, right? But you know the good thing about that particular um, event, and I think that this answers your question more specifically, is the, the founder did very right by everybody. Um, he called all the stakeholders and he said, look, I have maybe nine months of runway left, but we've evaluated everything. We cannot survive. We cannot, um, and then there were processes that were put in place to say, okay, you know what, I can return this money, um, make transitions for the customers, um, talk to the stakeholders. It was very clear and very transparent. So that communication, should I say strategy now, was very, very important, like really carrying people along, right? Um, I think a lot of times when things happen, there is people are trying to hide or they are trying to do something dodgy, maybe they want to keep all the money quickly and cash out and just escape you know, um, it makes it very difficult. But if you want to do it honorably, I think you want to be transparent. I think you want to communicate such that if anybody looks back at it and said, oh, what actually went wrong? It's not because you wanted to do, you wanted to be unethical or you wanted to do anything shady. You, you sincerely had made an effort, but it just wasn't working out. Um, and then even going that extra step to say, oh, how can you take care of your employees? How can you take care of your shareholders? Um, everybody involved um, really taking 
carrying them along and setting a timeline for a sort of transition to exit, as opposed to just waking up one day, say, oh, we, we've not paid salaries, this one, that one, and it's like news everywhere. So I think that's how I would suggest it feel honorably. Okay. Did you have anything to add? No. <laughs> All right. So we'll take a few more questions. Um, Mm, so you will do four questions. Bolu. Okay, um, Neka, um, how typically do you get involved with um, companies you invest in? I know we have a couple of founders. Once you give them money, they ghost you. I mean, how do you keep the balance? I know you have a couple of uh, uh, portfolio companies. How do you get involved and make sure everything is in order? That's a good one. Um, I think part of it is actually before you invest is getting to know the founders as part of the diligence process and really aligning on expectations and you know you look each other in the eye and you make some agreements and so I think that's part of it and part of it is also um, a good portion probably about maybe just about a quarter of our referrals come from entrepreneurs that we've backed or that are in our network. And so they understand how we like to work, which is not like a ghosting situation. <laughs> uh, for me, I usually will take a board seat on the company, especially if it's getting to that sort of series A, um, we'll engage with and talk to founders probably either a weekly, bi-weekly or tri-weekly basis, whether on phone, WhatsApp, et cetera. So, uh, the ghosting thing is <laughs> the, is not ideal and probably would speak to something's wrong, like emergent, like they're in hospital, you know, something, God forbid. But uh, it's not always easy to know that in advance. And so we're a bit lucky because we invest, um, we'll call it after the angel round, after the usually first round or so. Um, especially now as the ecosystem's emerging. And so you talk to other investors who've invested in the company before and the founder, how they've been. Are, did they ghost as well? <laughs> Are they providing regular updates or not? So you get a sense or you try as best you can to get a sense because, you know, fundraising is a very different thing than operating a business. And there are people who are just going to be fully focused on the business and don't want outside sort of. <laughs> uh, so do they have a team that can balance that and provide those kind of updates, um, et cetera? Okay. Um, I think I saw a hand. No. Yeah. All right. Uh, you talked about uh, um, targeting high and that's the, like, the 1% class of um, consumers and uh, the middle class, uh, but what about talking about um, financial services? Sometimes the people uh, down there they don't really need what you're creating, and the service you're building will unlock, will unlock that um, access that you want for the lower class, and it's going to come from the higher class. So we still like um, shown the um, the solution because it's having her, and even though it's going to unlock more opportunities, that will now stream down the middle class down to the uh, lower class and actually unlock the economy. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> if I think about the way like I've seen financial institutions be able to get to scale, it's almost impossible to do this without mass market unless you have, I'd say, even larger economy than we are currently in in Nigeria. And so if you're talking about like a firm that's a wealth manager, for example, I'd say unfortunately most um, high net worth individuals in Nigeria are using international asset managers. And so a strategy that's really focused on capturing the highest income earner wealth and maybe investing it is, I'd say, out of line with the way the financial system has worked for probably hundreds and hundreds of years, where it's actually this question about gathering a large amount of deposits and then reinvesting those deposits. Um, personally, <laughs> I was not, we are not that um, bold on the fintech, that, the type of fintech that I've seen that targets that highest end income earner. 
I think the middle class and the emerging middle class, the mass market consumerism more, um, there's more need there, there's more opportunity there. I think if you're talking about people who are in extreme poverty, which we have quite a lot in Nigeria, we're talking, let's call it 20 to 30%, maybe that's not where you focus, but I think there's a great market opportunity that's oftentimes overlooked because no offense to fintech founders, but perhaps a personal bias experience network. And so I'm very excited about founders who are focused not so much on that income segment. It's probably because it's also difficult. So, oh, it's like, incredibly challenging. <laughs> I mean, because you have to navigate the challenge that you pointed out, which is if you don't have money to sort of live and survive, you're not necessarily going to have money to put into an account or an investment or this kind of thing. So it is an incredibly challenging needle to thread, I guess. Um, but those who get it right and who really understand how different, I would call it informal, um, savings, credit, investing behaviors already are working, I, I think they'll do very well, and I hope to invest in them. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think, yes. Um, Joseph. Good evening. My name is Joseph. Uh, I think you've met uh, Sa. That's um, Mr. Babatunde, I think, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask... Um, I mean, about founders having to um, rely on funding all the time. Um, recently, um, um, something made the news uh, where a founder was giving uh, excuses for um, why they couldn't make um, some concession to their customers based on um, funding winters, and, and that was the excuse, right? And quite a number of people make this kind of claims uh, generally um, for why they cannot move forward a business at some point after they have started the business, especially in tech. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, as someone that um, does invest in businesses, um, what, is your, what do you think about this? What's your outlook and what is probably the best form for founders? I mean, of course, everybody will need to fundraise at some point in time, but I mean, if you're over-reliant on funding, uh, I mean, what does that, um, is, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing? Like, what does that mean for, only if you're on the investor side or if, you know, if you're on the founder side? Then I wanted to also ask um, um, something also, maybe a little bit crazy. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, in your, from being an investor, I mean, do you think that there's some people that should not be founders uh, like, or you think that this business should not exist, you know, and maybe you've invested in it and you've like, I should have not invested, oh no, this was like a bad call. Or like, do you, do you think that this thing should not be, we are not there yet, it's not ripe, and for all the reasons that you think that it is, thank you. Oh, a lot of questions. Um, I think on the first one, um, You'll have to remind me on the first one. I am now focused on the second okay. one. Um, is, it, is it really good to be oh, overly reliant on funding? Yeah. I have this... I don't have the notebook with me, but in one of the notebooks that I usually carry with me, on the back I have a little note card, I just say, um, most companies are not venture-backable. And I wrote it down. It was like a reflection from a module of this fellowship program I'm doing, and it was... It was a useful reminder that, unfortunately, I say no more than I say yes. And saying no can be very challenging. Uh, it's not an ideal thing to have to turn down a founder. And sometimes it happens much later in the process than you might want it to happen. But I'd say most startup ideas are not going to get to the type of scale uh, that should attract venture capital because venture capital is a very specific and pretty thin slice of the various capital that might be available to, to companies. Um, so I think while it is a privilege in a way to be able to invest capital into companies, um, I'd say most companies 
should not be seeking venture capital. And I think we have a lot of industries, a lot of spaces where successful companies can and have been started. I mean, if we look at the largest companies in Nigeria, most of them did not have venture capital as it were. Some of them had uh, very wealthy friends and family that helped to fund their businesses. <laughs> but um, I think there are sectors where you can actually create um, your own capital in a way. Uh, you can have profitable businesses that allow you to reinvest and scale and grow. Um, and we invest in some of those businesses, but oftentimes it's at a point where they're now ready to get to that sort of J curve and change in um, growth rate. Um, and I think it's not always easy to know if you're ready for that because that comes with uh, maybe a new board or outside oversight, reporting requirements, and even sometimes financial oversight and all of that. So I think most companies are not really well suited for venture capital. And in Africa, we don't have a lot of venture capital. So it's a almost tighter market in terms of competition for the limited venture capital dollars that exist. Um, and yet there are still massive gaps in terms of financing for early stage companies. And I think because venture is so loud, to your point about <laughs> very loud uh, industries, it's, it's much louder than the size, you know? I mean, VC and startup sort of reporting is somehow bigger than quarterly reports from the banks in Nigeria, which are like many multiples times the size of the entire African venture capital industry. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if I answered the first question. And then the second question, should some founders not be founders? Was that the question? <laughs> um, I mean, we've invested in companies where the people who started the company sort of are exiting the business and leaving it for the next generation, if you will, to take on. We are um, looking at a number of family-owned businesses where the second generation is coming in and the first generation is um, you know, in transition, we'll call it. But I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> if you have a, a great idea and you see a market opportunity and you go out and you're ready and willing to put in the work, I think you should go ahead. Uh, if you're gonna bring in outside capital, they may have judgments on whether the founder should be the founder. <laughs> and you have to know that as part of that, that journey. All right. Okay, so I'll, I was going to add something to what you said. Um, so someone shared a post with me last, I think a few weeks ago, on basically a formula for how you determine whether your startup is venture backable. So, is a bit. I'm. I'm just simplifying it a lot. But let's say you raise a fund from her. You raise. Um, let's say 100k from her, and her fund is a 10 million dollar fund. Um, if your startup can't give her an exit of 10 million dollars, she's not your guy, or you're not her guy, basically. So, if there's no pathway to returning a fund, and I jokingly said, don't raise money from a sequoia, for example, because or don't raise money from, I think it's Patek that raised 300 million. Do not go to Patek. Um, look for the guys who are managing $5 million funds. It's probably easier for you to give them a $5 million return than it is for you to give a $300 million return. Um, and to the other point about um, being overly reliant on venture capital funding. Um, so uh, less than 1,000 startups disclosed funding last year. And yes, a lot do not disclose, but I'm going to be very generous and say be 100 raised without telling us because VC guys are very loud, right? Um, less than 1,000 startups. The last time we did a FinTech report, I think we had more than 1,000 FinTech startups in just Nigeria alone. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but we do have just a little over 3,000 startups in Nigeria. Um, extrapolate for the rest of the continent, um, then you just realize that just a tiny fraction of startups do raise VC capital. Um, you're unlikely to actually raise 
it's more you're more likely to raise sorry you're more like you're more likely to not raise capital than you are to raise capital um i don't know how many decks you've seen a year but i'm very sure you don't do more than maybe 20 um okay fewer than that so she's probably investing in like one percent of the um founders she comes across so um maybe the mindset should be it's nice to go after vc money but i most likely will not get it but can i still build my my startup without um vc money so yeah um, we would take one more question. I'll just add, I, I think that's exactly the right approach. Um, I will say different funds have different strategies, and so it's also better to understand what their strategy is. Our view is that while there is this gap in terms of capital, we also have historical data which suggests there's only been about 10 unicorns, maybe 14, maybe 10, maybe now 8, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, plus or minus, somewhere between 8 and 14, we'll call it, unicorns in Africa. If you look at India, you have like 223 unicorns. And so, obviously, India is a country, Africa is a continent, but that's a very large disconnect. And so, our view is not that we're looking for unicorns, but we're looking for startups that can give us, obviously, a significant return <laughs> of our capital whether that's through um, dividends for the more real sector businesses, whether that's through buybacks or other exits, but we're not necessarily looking for companies to IPO and to reach you know, billion dollar valuations in our strategy because the jury is still out on that unicorn ability. I think it is there. I'm not saying it's not there, but to, for our strategy only be making you know, six to 20 investments, less than 20 investments in a year, to hit on that one, it's, it's a bit of too much magic involved. <laughs> uh, so our view is that um, you need a slightly more focused strategy. So that's part of why we do primarily Series A and pre-Series A. And we're not really doing the type of um, 100K checks in plenty companies type of approach. All right, so one more question. Uh, okay. Please make it very brief. Bolu, hold the mic. Oh. No, hold the mic. All right. My name is Emmanuel Mukuru, um, co founder for Big Weather Logistics Technology. So, my question is this As a co founder, what bosses do I have to check to get your, your attention as an investor? Let's be practical. Not, I'm not talking about the idea, I'm not talking about the person, I'm talking about I want to come to your office. That I, I think I, I went through your website and I found your office. I'm coming to the office. I want to check, pitch my idea to you. What bosses do I have to check to do this thing in practical terms, in simple language? Just give it to us. She has to be in the office, first of all. <laughs> uh, wow, okay. First of all, please don't come to the office. <laughs> um, um, I think it's, it's challenging. So we talked about the founder... Um, part of it, the team part of it, the product part of it. Uh, part of it is that we have to look at where we've already invested from a sector perspective, geographic perspective, and see if your company can fit into this thing we call portfolio construction. And if we've, let's say, already invested in 10 or 15 companies in the fund, and then we have another 15 left to go, we also need to look at those first 15 companies and say, okay, are these companies going to be the ones to help to return the fund? And how do we think about how much capital we want to put back into them? So it's all about like a, the broader vision. And I know you are going to be focused on your startup and making it <laughs> the right one for us. But we also have to think about how you compare to other things we've invested in. Uh, is it a sector that we're excited about and bullish about or one where we're like, we have enough exposure to? Uh, so I think that's really what you have to keep in mind as well. And for us, we like to know companies for some time in advance. And I have found the startups who are best at this are actually okay with hearing no and staying in touch, um, giving updates. You know, even if we don't end up investing, keeping that level of relationship or even asking for um, advice if they know we have a specific sector expertise or area of, of interest. Uh, so I think part of it is getting to know the investor as well. 
All right. Um, so we can take just one more question. But is the caveat. The question. Yes, the question has to be directed at him. Is it directed at him? Is directed at him. Perfect. So, um, trying to build a startup, right? Um, I think I have been able to understand that there is usually a product strategy and a business strategy, and sometimes they may vary in a way that um, one outweighs the other, right? So, trying to you know build a startup and all that. What strategy would you pick over the other? Would you rather go for you know the business strategy? That sometimes undermines what you have in plan for the product or you run products first and then tag business along. Okay. <laughs> so, so first of all, I personally don't see them as mutually exclusive. Um, my, my definition of a product, and this is a very personal definition, is um, I like to think of it like almost a branded commodity. Um, that's what I tell myself, right? So it's like if you have, um, if you have soap, soap, soap is a commodity. If you have locks, it's a product. Um, so in in that sense, I I I wouldn't necessarily separate. Um, I wouldn't separate the business strategy from the product, right? Um, maybe there are other things, there are other words that I would personally use. Maybe maybe the marketing strategy and the product strategy. But if you are building a product, the, the commercial viability is supposed to be embedded in the product. Um, from a business standpoint, I don't think you even have a, a good product if it's not selling or there's nobody that is paying for it. Or, or maybe another way to look at it is you have a product that doesn't have product market fit. I think that's the more um, politically correct word, right? Um, so product market fit. So if you have a product and the market doesn't accept it after a year, two years, three years, if NECA will keep funding you for those three years, um, is, it, um, is it worth it continuing? Uh, I would say no. So you, you almost have to, you must achieve that product market fit for you to even be in business. And I say it sometimes because we have product people in the office, we have marketing people in the office, and I always, I'm always upset when I see them working across purposes, right? Product people have built these fancy things. They didn't even tell marketing about it. They will now send the prototype and say, oh yeah, go and sell it. Do screen, do, um, we want social media posts. When I say, these guys were not involved with you at the beginning. We still had that argument on my way here that you guys are just marketing. You people are building products. Where is it supposed to be this energy? I mean, it doesn't, obviously, it won't be five years old if that was happening all the time, right? But it, it happens sometimes. So there's supposed to actually be um, a very good synergy between the product, uh, the marketing, the selling, the technology, and every other aspect. But the product needs to be bringing in money. And if it's bringing in money, then back to you know, Joseph's concern, you wouldn't necessarily have to raise money to stay alive. All right. So. That's, that's the last question we can take. I'm sorry. Um, if you do have any questions, I can't make promises. You can send them to me, and I will try to get them to answer your questions. So thank you so much, Neka and Babatunde, for taking out the time to spend here.